Hi, I'm Duewa Frazier, and you're listening to episode 16 of Nerdacity Podcast. And today my guest is author Damaris B. Hill, PhD. Dr. Hill is the author of A Bound Woman is a Dangerous Thing, The Fluid Boundaries of Suffrage and Jim Crow, Staking Claims in the American Heartland, Invisible Textures. Similar to her creative process, Hill's scholarly research is interdisciplinary. Hill is an associate professor of creative writing at the University of Kentucky. Hill has a keen interest in the work of Toni Morrison and theories regarding rememory as a philosophy and aesthetic practice. She is inspired by the anxieties of our contemporary existence that are further complicated by fears that some linear narratives of history fail to be inclusive, stating, quote, I belong to a generation of people who do not fear death, but are afraid that we may be forgotten, end quote. In addition to working or taking workshops with writers such as Lucille Clifton, Nikki Finney, Natasha Traithway, Deborah Willis, and Monifa Love Asante and others, Hill sought to strengthen her writing with a terminal degree in English and another in Women and Gender Studies. Her development as a writer has also been enhanced by the institutional support of the McDowell Colony, Key West Literary Seminar Writers' Workshops. Callaloo Literary Writers Workshop, Eckerd College Writers Conference, Writers in Paradise, Project on the History of Black Writing, Brett Loaf Writers Conference in Vermont, Brett Loaf Writers Conference in Sicily, The Furious Flower Poetry Center, The Urban Bush Women, The Watering Hole Poetry, and others. Her work has appeared in African American Review, ESPN. W, Sal Wester, Sleep Magazine, American Studies Journal, Meridians, Shadowbox, Tidal Basin Review, Reverie, Tongues of the Ocean, Women in Judaism, and numerous anthologies. I hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, Damaris. How are you? I'm great. Thanks. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. I'm so happy to be here. Let's get started. Of course. And so a bound woman is a dangerous thing. I want to congratulate you on your beautiful uh, poetry collection. And I'm so amazed at your uh, last year as I've been following you, seeing you doing so many wonderful events. I know you were at uh, Furious Flower in Mm -hmm. the past year. Is that correct? That is correct. Furious Flower is a wondrous and beautiful place. It's a sacred space. It really is. Wow. So tell me about that. Was that a reading uh, for your book or uh, a celebration with a a group of other poets? Um, It was a celebration with a group of other poets. But um, uh, the Furious Flower Poetry Institute is real uh, close and dear to my heart. For a number of reasons, Um, the founder, Dr. Joanne Gavin and I share a lot of history before we entered one another's lives. And then instantly she's so um, experienced in poetry, but also so generous, so generous in every and any which way that um, you can't help but to fall in love with her, both professionally and friendship-wise, because she's just that good. And so um, we both attended um, Morgan State University in Baltimore, Maryland. Oh, okay. Yeah. At Shout out times. to HBCUs. I'm also an HBCU grad myself. So I'm- Okay, where'd I'm, you go? And uh, my godbrother actually graduated from Morgan State. So I'm, I'm well familiar with it. Okay. What did, mm-hmm. did you attend Howard? Where did you go? Uh, I went to Hampton in Virginia. So we were oh, just, the you know, other a few HU. Hours. Yeah. Yes. The real HU. But we the won't go HU, there. The real HU. Yeah. That's yes. what you guys say. The real <laughs> HU. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I knew um, it was something but like so that. But so any, anyway, you were saying? Yeah. I just want to also say about Hampton. I really like Hampton and I wanted to attend Hampton. Uh-huh. But you know, y'all got that graveyard on, on the campus. Oh, and oh I, no, that doesn't, that doesn't, that's not really a part of the campus life, however. Okay. 
<laughs> how about yeah. the 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 ocean, honey? How about the the beach? Listen, the, the seafood. <laughs> right, you guys had me on all of that, and I saw that little graveyard, and I was like, "Oh, daddy, I can't go here." Oh, girl, that that ain't nothing. But but, <laughs> but you you went where you went, and it's mm-hmm. all HBCU love. <laughs> it is all HBCU love. It is definitely all HBCU love. So we both graduated from the same English department at Morgan State University, which is a very fine English department, and we shared some instructors whom later in probably maybe 10, 10 years or more after I met Dr. Gavin, I learned this information. And I learned that we shared um, a lot of friends, big sisters, aunties, and, you know, and also professors and teachers. Wow, that's wonderful. Yeah. And so would you say Dr. Gavin is a, a mentor of yours in terms of poetry and, and academia? Definitely, definitely. I think, I think that's kind of an understatement, right? Because mm-hmm. she is definitely a mentor to any who in contact with her. But it's also important to extend that metaphor of her being a mentor to also really talking about her being a guiding force in African-American poetry. Wow. Mm -hmm. Right? It's important to talk about her in that context because like a mentor is kind of understating the the kind of work and pilgrimage that she instructs. Sure. Sure. You know? And I loved it. Now, I don't know her, so that's why I was, Mm -hmm. you know, asking... uh, I, I know her, have seen her name linked with Furious Flower, but it's nice to hear about your sharing of your connection and relationship with her, um, mm-hmm. you know, because that's community. It's, it's community and it's so important because um, I, don't, I don't have the, the community such as like Cabe Canem or some, um, some of these highly prestigious, I would say, uh, creative writing communities mm-hmm. that a lot of my colleagues have but, been a part now of. Now that's so odd, Demiris, because I actually always thought of you as a Cave Canem Fellow. I kind of see mm-hmm. you in uh, that grouping of uh, illustrious poets of you know, the next generation. Uh, oh, you believe know. me, I tried. I applied <laughs> lots of times. But and you, I know many of them, and they're so, exactly. they're so wonderful. And, and, and the same for me, by the way. I'm not a fellow, mm-hmm. as, but I've been in the circle and, you know, done some workshops and all that. Uh, but in thinking about, you know, your connection with Furious Flower, I know a lot of the Cave Canem poets do quite a bit with Furious Flower, and that's why I thought you were, you know, mm-hmm. uh, well, a fellow. Well, I'm a... Mm-hmm. I'm just going to say this, and I, I don't mean, I don't know how this is going to come across, and I don't mean, and I'm not saying this to insult or shade anyone. I'm just talking about my experience. Sure. My experience is really a Black feminist creative writing community experience. Mm, I love that. Right? And I don't mm-hmm. mean that to take away from any of the nurturing that anyone else has had. Oh, no. I because... don't think you, you, you do, because I see here that Roxanne Gay blurbed your book. You know, Eve Ensler mm-hmm. blurbed your book. And so that is, you know, that community of women, for sure. Yeah, and that community of women, they were, and, and Ida Lamont, Ada Lamont, were, they were very uh, generous to me for, for blurbing my book, and Mitchell Jackson very generous to me but I just want to, in this, in this particular historical moment, I want to say some things about Black feminist community. Please Cause do. We, yeah, because we've seen the, the power and the cultivation of Black women's community to initiate positive justice and democratic change in, in, in this country. And what I want to say is, number one, of black women that earn degrees earn degrees at HBCU environment in HBCU environment. You got that right. And not only that, go on to Ivy leagues and grad school and all this other stuff. And HBCU was the foundation. Right. And it it is, it is a network, a training ground and a boot camp for leadership and justice in any arena. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. In any arena. So I was fortunate enough to go to Morgan State University, as I spoke of, and met there 
Monifa Lovasanti, who is also a great poet, playwright, fiction writer, who encouraged me to reach out to Lucille Clifton. Wow. Who encouraged, right, who encouraged me in turn to go to Furious Flower when I was working as a college administrator and did not understand the significance of that space. Mm. Mm. How you blessed, I mean, how saying? blessed you are. And you're basically saying you have met and been in the same space with Lucille Clifton. Right. But I, I mean, that's not what that, yeah, I'm saying that. But what I'm trying to say is that my, my, my journey towards poetry started with a type of Black feminist nurturing that continued throughout my my poetry uh journey like you know for a lot of people I'm kind of just like popping up but I've been in this since 2000 since before 2004 since like 2001 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right right and I was just sitting quiet paying attention trying to learn right Mm -hmm. and that's what I mean about like my orientation may have been different into the world of poetry sure because It might have been for a lack of a better term, sitting at kitchen tables Mm. rather than sitting in institutions. Wow. And I'm not taking anything away from. No, I don't feel you are. Because I, and let me tell you, and I appreciate you stating that because I myself have seen that I had a different path as well. I, similar to you, early 2000s, I was in New York City, and that's when I began sharing my poetry. And my path was going to workshops, attending Center for Black uh, Literature uh, events mm-hmm. at Megar Evers, going, uh, taking Saturday workshops with the late poet Luis uh, Reyes mm-hmm. Rivera, who co-edited Bum Rush uh, the Page with Tony Medina, sitting mm-hmm. with, you know, going to Sunday uh, brunch and, and poetry workshop with... Uh, Abiodun Oyewole of The Last Poets. And so even though, yes, I had my bachelor's in English, I went on to get an MFA and other degrees, but my my path was, I would say, more in what I studied was the Black arts uh, tradition. Mm -hmm. Not saying that others didn't, but I I think like you, I had a different path as well. And I was teaching K to 12 public schools. So I didn't go straight from Yes. MFA to I, I, co- college. I had some stuff going on in between, you know. Uh, I did too. Like, I, you know, I had my son at age 20. I was a Baltimore City public school teacher. That also really delayed my writing career because, oh, you wow. know, when you're taking care of a child, you know, writing does not necessarily cut it right. for, uh, su- you know, uh, sustaining someone in, right. in this, you know, country. And so um, I really you know, kind of strategically planned to earn my PhD and get some of those institutional affirmations and trainings Mm -hmm. once my son was 14. Wow. That's amazing. Well, I take my hat off to you, uh, Damaris, because it seemed in a relatively uh, short amount of time as I was viewing your website and looking at your uh, CV and your different events and writings that you got it done, girl. Like every year you've been working, 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 whether it was an academic uh, credential, publishing, teaching, you've been doing mm-hmm. it all. So I just want to, you know, take my hat off to you. Um, Thank you. As a fellow creative woman and educator that you did the damn thing and you're still doing it. Um, Thank you. And so, you know, that torch has certainly been passed on to you. Um, and so, in terms of a bound woman is a dangerous thing, what was your inspiration for this collection? Well, I had, I had a lot of inspiration, but I, the short story is I have been rewriting this manuscript probably since 2001 under Monifa Lovasanti. And what you see now is the third inter- iteration of my first manuscript. Mm, mm-hmm. Right. And so sometimes you have to mature into the work that you want to do. Right. Yes. And who I was in 2001, even though I had ambitions to write a book very much like this, 
I wasn't quite there. I wasn't, I wasn't ready for the book. I wasn't ready. I wasn't mature enough. I wasn't skilled enough to write the book. Um, I thought the book was done in 2012. Uh, and in between 2012 and 2014, I submitted the second version of the first manuscript, right? To mm-hmm. a number of places. And I was ranking, but I wasn't coming in with any prize. Okay. And one of my friends who's also a multi genre writer, um, he was like, Look, you're not hooking any prizes because this is really three manuscripts. Whoa. And I was like, What? And he was like, This is three manuscripts, man. And he was like, What you need to do, he's like, You're never gonna and I needed to hear this, you're never gonna run out of ideas. Mm. He's like, so you need to stop and see and take inventory of what you have. Sure. And I'm not somebody who like, like paces myself according to others. So that would be very difficult for me to, to, to assess about myself. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. I just don't know how to do it. It's a skill I'm not, I don't really have. Um, and so then I acquired uh, an agent for a piece of fiction that I was working on. And we were working on that fiction for a year. And after the year, she found out that I wrote poetry. And she was like, well, send me some of the poetry. <laughs> and like, I, I sent her like, I think it was like maybe 10 pages or less. Mm-hmm. And she said that night, she was like, oh, this poetry is coming out first. And I was like, woman, are you crazy? Wow. I was like, people can't eat off off poetry. Mm. I got student loans. I got a baby in school. Mm -hmm. Like, you tripping. We need to get this book out here. Get this fiction out here, right? right. And so, you know, she let me talk junk. And and my mentor, you know, I love working with with feminist women because they the same way. They be like, I done told you, right? Like, they... they, (laughs) So, you know, she let me play around and think I was doing what I told her I was about to do. And I called myself tightening up that novel. And as soon as I put that novel on her desk, she was like, where that poetry at? Wow. I already told you that that poetry is coming first. Hmm. And, you know, by the time I was in my 40s, I had enough sense not to talk back. Right. But before then, I didn't. I done said lots of crazy things to people about what I'm about to do. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. At that point, I had matured enough and I had enough sense to shut up. Exactly. just sit down and do the work. Because it sounds like you had people in your corner and they were kind of giving you those cues, you know. Yes. And that's what's really great. Yeah. And what she said when she read the manuscript, she said, this is a great manuscript, but it's two books. And I said in my mind, nah, it's really three. Mm. I just let her keep talking. She said, we're going to break this book up. Okay. And after we divided that manuscript, what you're reading now is a portion of it that evolved into a bound woman is a dangerous thing. Wow. That's heavy because I'm looking at this and I'm like, I mean, this could be a novel just in terms of the, the length of it. You know, just when you first look at it, you're like, no, nah, this couldn't be poetry, but it is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, you have a really, really nice meaty collection here. And it's like, turn the page and you're in another, you know, it, it's like a different world on each page. Thank you for that. You know? Thank you. And so I was very fortunate for that. I, we didn't think that a, a, a publishing house would take me on my own terms. Mm. We didn't think that. And so do you feel, you know, when people say uh, luck is when preparation meets opportunity? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I've been writing this now. I've been writing this poetry book. I mean, I told you since like 2001. Yes, you did. <laughs> and then it came. And I, <laughs> right. And I've been looking at women in prison and this whole complexity of that and the erasure of that in the American landscape since at least 2008. Mm. Nobody anticipated in 2008 when Barack Obama was being elected in the era of hope. Nobody anticipated this cultural moment. So right? true. Mm. And so, so it, it is that. And so let me ask you, because Sandra Bland happened in, I want to say 2018, 2017. Sandra Bland happened in, 
16 or 17. Okay. Yeah. Were you at that time, did you have a sense of, because those kind of things were happening, it seemed like so quickly, one after another, after another tragedy. But they weren't. They just weren't publicized. Mm. They've been happening. Like the the persecution and reinforcement of social hierarchies that impact black women violently, socially or professionally is a constant in American culture because it's the only way that you, you can continue to perpetuate this false belief in a hierarchy where white and male is at the top. Mm-hmm. I mean, name one black woman you know that don't get it done. Oh, I couldn't do that because all of them I know get it done. Right. And I'm not taking away from other people's stride or other intersections. I'm not taking away from that. But I'm, yeah. Did you somehow, I guess, too, what I'm asking is, did you somehow feel at that time your collection was not complete until you could reveal some of those voices as you have included Sandra Bland? First of all, let's be very clear. Do a why. Yes, ma'am. I am extremely insecure about my writing. It is the most insecure space in my entire life. You have got to be kidding. No, I Because I'm looking at this going, uh, genius fellow, what do they call it? That's the, uh, the Guggenheim Fellowship. (laughs) <laughs> now I'm I mean I am extremely like I didn't think this book was finished when I turned it in. Oh no, you're not you're a perfectionist. That's what that is. Um I don't know what that is, but Okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you, I was like tragic. I not even tragically, but I'm extremely insecure. I never know when work is finished. Mhm. I do rely sometimes on my friends telling me Sandra Bland did come after a lot of the main when when we were able to uh, secure um, Bloomsbury to publish the manuscript. My editor at that time was like, listen, you don't have to change anything in the book and I'll take it right now. And I changed the book twice. You mean after she said, I'll take it right now? Yeah, I changed it twice. (laughs) Like, I'm extremely insecure. It's one of the reasons why I wear, I think, like, I'm trying to, like, really get to the bottom of this. It's something I'm working on. I think it's one of the reasons why I wear a lot of makeup when I have to read. No. Because I'm so scared. But that's our, that's our culture, girl. That's our, I mean, I got into wearing makeup some years ago, too, and I love it. I put on makeup Mm -hmm. just to do my podcast, even if you, a person can't see me. That's our drama. Uh-huh. You ever seen Intozaki Shange, right? When she was living? Of course. Of course. Girl, she could wear some eyeshadow, some rouge, some eyeliner. Yes. She could... And I do love a beat. I'm yes. Like... That's what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, but it's it's also a way for, for me. I think it's also a kind of mask for me for I okay. Because like I try to be as intimate with the page as I can. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't mean that when I'm reading this, I'm like, oh my God, why am I telling all my damn business? You know, like, <laughs> excuse me for cursing. But, you know, when I read it, and I mean, I own it, right? But it doesn't mean when it's time to revisit it that it's easier. Wow. Mm. You know? Or is it like what your friend said? You like you're adding on to this one collection, not realizing this is like three books. Like when do you cut it off? You know? I don't know. I I don't know. And I I really don't know. (laughs) And so the other two are in the works or being worked on, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, I'm working, I'm working on my, my second poetry collection now. Some of the poems from the, um, from the initial manuscript are in there and there are some additional poems um you know that I don't know if I said all I needed to say like I still have the same doubts you know I don't know if I said all I needed to say I don't know if I said it correctly like I'm waiting I'm waiting to figure it out but yeah and each one of these I mean this is just me Damaris as a reader mm-hmm. um 
to me is is also a book on its own. You know, Lucille is one book, you know. Thank you. Uh, Ida B. Wells is one book. Zora Neale Hurston is one book. I mean, mm-hmm. but then, you know, I know your agent and editors probably have their own, you know, plan for you. But I'm just saying, you know, your genius shall know no bounds. I mean, you know, Thank you know you. what I mean? Thank so, you. I want to encourage um, you in that vein. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I felt I needed, in a weird way, um, particularly as times. So before this, of course, you know, we were talking about working on the novel about women in prison. But also I was doing a lot of work about studying the first half of the 20th century, mm-hmm. which, you know, is easily duplicated by like what's happening now. Right. So um, after, like in 2015 and 2016, when things started to culturally shift away from the hope and civility that Barack Obama ushered into American society, Mm. into something more visceral, criminal, and anti-American. Truly, truly. Um there was no escape. You know, there wasn't a lot of of breathing room in between my uh, imaginative work and the reality unto which we were all living. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so um, at that point, a strategy that I had developed in graduate school helped to inform the book because as things became more tense, I would take like my my little bit of uh like black feminist vitamin, right? Mm-hmm. Like black feminist sustaining vitamin before I leave out the house. I'd be like, all right, let me just get a couple of quotes in from Tony Moore <laughs> your, your armor. to remind me, <laughs> right? To remind me as I go out, I need this helmet on. Right. So the things <laughs> that the world are telling me will not impact who I am. And, and how I'm negotiating this space. I need to be informed by my ancestors who have more knowledge than I do, mm-hmm. better strategies, and already know how to survive a time and place like this. True indeed. And so, and you that's kind of the book. So, Damaris, that leads me to now two questions. One, in this time that we're in, where does a writer like you go to for support, you know, during this time? Okay. So COVID is very, very hard for me. The first draft of my next poetry collection was uh, extremely sad. And it's, it's about Black girlhood. And I really had to go back through it consciously looking for spaces of joy Mm. and where I could expand upon it because, you know, I was just so inundated because I'm, I'm, I mean, a lot of people are affected by COVID and I'm, you know, unfortunately I do recognize COVID, but in my mind, it is a type of plague and a type of, uh, cleansing that the universe is doing Mm -hmm. in response to the toxins that we are putting into the universe that's how i feel true this 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 uh pandemic Mm -hmm. happening right Mm -hmm. and so i was really really sad about that and then i was really really sad about the cognitive cognitive dissonance of some of my brothers sisters cousins Mm. Um, that call themselves Americans Mm -hmm. in this place that we have called America, but ain't really America. And their ability to allow things that are undemocratic, um, but uniquely American to, um, I would say, engulf their civil liberties Mm -hmm. while they think they punishing me. Mm. Wow. Right? Mm-hmm. You're so desperate to punish me that your civil liberties are 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 in kind, in tandem. Yep. 
with the civil liberties of mind that you're trying to throw away. True indeed. And we see how they did with that. They have literally lost their minds, um, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And I think they were inspired to lose their minds. A lot of people, a lot of people need to, uh, need to experience the consequences of the events that took place uh, January 6th. Not just those people that rioted, but all the, all of those people who who uh use propaganda mm. to make them believe that they were righteous. Mm. So true. Mm-hmm. And and so Damaris, how has the pandemic? And I've asked this with every writer that I've mm-hmm. interviewed recently. How has the pandemic impacted your? You kind of you touched on that, but as a whole, mm-hmm. impacted your writing and your creativity. Well, it has reminded me that I really want to be uh, home writing a lot. Mm. I've saved a lot of time commuting back and forth. I've saved a lot of time getting dressed in the morning. <laughs> it, it's actually, in, in terms of time management, it's been awesome. Um, and because I had a lot on my plate, uh, in the professional workspace of uh, that is not writing this year. I was actually getting up at four in the morning for about four or five months during the pandemic to finish this next book because I didn't want to interrupt it by emails from work. Wow. Yeah. And so that was actually great, you know, being mm-hmm. able to get up at four and to write for a significant amount of time without factoring in the commute time to work in, into my schedule. Right. Because I could get dressed for work within a half an hour instead of cutting my writing short two hours. Right. You know? Mm-hmm. So that that was a, a type of gift. Yes. But it has, it's, it's modified um, my stimuli. Like, I watch a lot more television. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Luckily, my imagination can convince me that these characters on TV may actually be my friends. <laughs> uh, <laughs> girl, let me tell you, during this pandemic, I don't know where I got this from. I have become a whole TV commentator. I was never doing yes. this before, and now I'm doing recaps on Bridgerton and, and all types of stuff. I'm like, girl. <laughs> Right. I'm like, let me go over <laughs> um, my friend house, the Duke. Yes. What he's talking about today. Yeah. So it's definitely been been that. And um background noise television has been has become something that I was not into before. Mm. So just having television on in the background was never really my thing. I was definitely more of a music person. Yeah, that's me too. Yep. Right. But it's something about the longing for human connection that hearing a human voice um, in the background can provide a a sense of balance in that. Right. Or comfort that desire a little bit. Mm -hmm. And not that my friends aren't available because they are. Yeah. You know, Mm -hmm. but I'm just talking about some of the ways that I'm watching myself evolving hope sure and and what about self-care um you know i i like that's one of my topics that i like to talk about where okay. do you or what would you feel comfortable sharing do you practice self-care as a writer i do as an academic what does that mean to you i do there are a couple of ways that i do it so I had always indulged in stand-up comedy <laughs> because I write things that are so um, can can be so, um, for a lack of a better term, depressing. But also, I write in a particular way to engage with the mind, mm-hmm. so that if you read it, you're probably not going to forget it. Yeah, and. There there are consequences for writing like that, right? Like, if that is my process, right? So that also becomes a part of me. So stand-up comedy is a great way to balance that for me mm-hmm. because it's still nurturing my writing craft because it's a lot, if it's good, it's the art of storytelling. When it's really good, 
it's also has a musicality to it like poetry and that musicality comes out in timing Mm. timing is is so important to comedy so it also teaches me about time rhythm and punctuation in terms of sound yeah so uh stand-up comedy is a kind of craft that informs me so of course I've been doing a lot more of that but I have also become overindulgent in home goods (laughs) okay (laughs) home goods is great I was just there the other day looking around they it is great oh I will order it off the interweb oh but like (laughs) Um, but all of it, right? So, like, you know, the room I'm in has to be a vibe. Mm-hmm. And I had that before, but I might have been performing at maybe like an 83 average. Okay. Not now, <laughs> boy. I got it together. Do you, you really? Oh. Uh, <laughs> on it. So, is this in terms of, you know, is this artwork? Is this plush? Uh, it's, it's pillows, all of it. it's, the decor. It's all of it. Okay. <laughs> it is all of it. It's artwork. It's visually stimulating pieces. And my challenge area that I'm particularly working on since the pandemic mm-hmm. is uh, blending textures and or patterns. Oh, okay. Okay. All right, and so- I don't like, yeah, I don't like a whole bunch of color, but you know, just those variations. Mm-hmm. So you're talking yeah. that interior designer talk. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm really I like I like beauty. I think I think beauty is a is a luxury, but I also it's it's almost like an essential luxury. Mm-hmm. I'm not a, I'm not necessarily invested in the practical. Sure. I like beauty and functional. Mm-hmm. And so do you have a particular writing routine even uh, I do. now? Okay. I don't always stick to it, but um, I don't really like to sit down and write for less than four hours. Mm-hmm. So that's why getting up at four in the morning is so important because then I can make sure that my phone is off and I can just sit and be with uh, the voices in my head or whatever there is to do. I like to read for a good portion of that four hours before I begin to write. Mm-hmm. I'm, I have a tea kettle now in, in my um, in my study or library so I don't have to like leave. Wow. Um, yeah. And- so that that's the kind of thing. And I was doing that before but I would do it outside of the house and I would only do it on days that were like scheduled. Sure. And so since I'm home more now, like it can, I, even if I go into the study at noon, I'm probably not going to come out until four after four. Wow. That's like a whole day. I mean, you know, do you, you yeah. know, have coffee, juice, water, you know, what, what's your. Right now I have tea. Okay. Mm-hmm. I have tea. Um, I drink a jasmine tea. I have really bad food allergies, you know. We all have things, but mm-hmm. um, so I drink a jasmine tea, and then after one or two cups of that, sometimes I'll just drink hot water. Sometimes I'll drink room temperature water, and I'll just be with it, you know. Wow, I love that. It sounds like you have your r- routine down pat, and you know it's all a part of your self care, a mm-hmm. comfortable environment. Like we need to hear about that. Yes, I have a really heavy robe. That's good now. <laughs> um, a really heavy robe. I've 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 grown to to buy. I have a, like a a big comfy sweater that sits on the back of my chair in my study. Mm-hmm. That's not quite a robe, but it kind of functions as a robe. Sure, you know. Yes, <laughs> like, you know. So I've really settled into that. Type. Like I don't, I, you know, how we how I don't know how I'm getting out the house when this is over, girl. I, I hear you because <laughs> right now it's like you, you make it so that your living environment has everything you need and you don't even need to go out. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, exactly. So, okay. Uh, 
Damaris, are you ready to read a few poems right now? Yes. What would you like to hear? I would love to hear In the Garden. Okay. So, uh, you know, I already spoke that uh, Miss Clifton was very, very generous to me when she was alive. And I actually did my master's thesis uh, looking critically at some of her work. And so, um, mm-hmm. yeah, she was very, very nice to me. And I couldn't imagine putting this book together in, in, the, in the iteration that it was in and not including some of these poems. So in the garden, an echo poem from Miss Clifton. In the garden of marble and men, I swivel slowly in. I am some clay-faced Janus, following the drums of your tongue. Did you know these walls are prone to echo? God is dead, yet the walls are greedy for confessions. Your words mirror my truth. Forgive me, my voice is a tapestry of tacks trying to wear the skin of your hymns. Hmm. Excuse me, I do have to get my reading glasses. I love you, but I have to take a quick second and find them. Oh, sure. Okay, I found them. (laughs) Okay, I I love that. You know what, and I could see, you know, wow, it's like I could see Miss Clifton's face and... This poem is just so easy. It just flows. Thank you. Now, is there a reason that um, you split it up into uh, the two stanzas? Is um, And a lot of these poems, I wanted permission to have a conversation with a person. And... Um, not this specific poem, but some of the poems, I even asked permission to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. And so in this, Miss Clifton, one of the things that she talks about often, and one of the things that she told me is that when you have space in the poem, it's not for the poet, it's actually for the reader. Mm. And so I wanted to talk about like a space of admiration right that was kind of distance Mm -hmm. distanced and then the second stanza is a type of intimacy where I'm like you know a little bit closer to the work of Clifton right a little bit closer in in my type of admiration right that's not from a distance And so I kind of wanted to play with that. And I also wanted to play with this idea of echoes. I mean, that's why I'm talking about marble. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you are distanced in a marble hall, there's a lot of noise, but there's not necessarily an intimacy. There's an echo, but there's not necessarily an intimacy. Right. But I think uh, in the second stanza, I'm working towards an an intimacy, Mm. a, a chasing type of echo. Right. Sure. Beautiful, beautiful, very nice. Thanks. And thank you. So, what can we hear next? Um, I think we can hear you, uh, Sandra Bland or okay. Zora Neale Hurston. Okay. Let's go with Zora because it's it's definitely um a writer. Okay. And I don't want to say that Sandra Bland is not a writer either. I mean in terms of iconic writers. Exactly. Mm, so when I was writing about Zora Neale Hurston, we, you know, in our culture, we remember Zora Neale Hurston as being sassy and fearless, right? But I want, I didn't want to detract from her humanity. I was sure there were times that she was not fearless. There were, there were times, uh, of, of insecurity and in places where she was unsure that actually nurtured her fear and fearlessness, right? Mm-hmm. And so I thought about um, what's the situation 
where she would feel the authority of others, even if she wasn't intimidated by it. So I thought about Zora being accepted to Northwestern and accepted to Columbia for PhD programs, but not allowed to attend. Whoa. Right. Yes. So, yeah. (laughs) Right. And so Mm. let's talk about like her being involved in anthropology, a science that set out to prove the superiority of something that she was not Mm. and still becoming dominant in that field. Sure. Right. Yep. And so that's how I wanted to imagine this poem. And I wanted to kind of also talk about, you know, kind of what we started off talking about, how, you know, the way history tells us that intellectual intellectualism is like bred in these formal institutions. Mm-hmm. But that's that's not always the I case. I found that to be exclusive. Right. right. So um, Zora Neale Hurston, before the Bronx Zoo, Oda Benga boarded a ship flipping a fish scale like a coin. The first shiny thing he'd seen since his family was murdered. Leopold's soldier still carries the finger of Benga's daughter in his pocket to ward away evil. Remember him, the man in with the monkeys. Who can forget the ways Banga grit his teeth? They resembled claws. Zora reads of him caged in the zoo the same year her mother becomes a ghost. Thick and wet with memories, Zora has a hard time keeping still. From Morgan in Baltimore to Howard in the district to Barnard near the Bronx, Banga haunts her. In slide her rituals, folding the news clippings in with her lunch, reading the creases, mysteries drapes in her, draped in her palms. This odd communion, the cradles of hell always take the shape of a woman's lips. Using a looking glass made from a martini, Madison Grant traces Zora's square jaw. When she whispers about Ann Spencer and the thespian border banger, Grant's throat burns with curiosity. He considers Zora and all that is alchemy. Is she the prophecy of stones? The fire within the dark sciences he conjures. Mm. I love that. Yeah, so Madison Grant like kind of came up with this this, you know, these this type of medical racism that that would would be the type of person that would say Oda Banga is the missing link between human beings and animals. Mm -hmm. You know, and then Zora comes in explaining that he's an actor. And in fact, he lives with a black woman who's been a poet. (laughs) You know, Mm -hmm. and they living good down in Virginia. Right. What you talking about? Mm. You know, and so I kind of wanted to put her in a vulnerable position, you know, academically, you know. Sure. And who she might have been before her mother died with her curiosity. So I guess it's kind of a girlhood poem, too. Sure. Oh, I love that. Mm. Wow. So much here. Wow. Damaris, I, boy, I could just talk to you for hours and hours, but I certainly want to leave uh, more Did for our IG interview tomorrow. <laughs> okay. And, uh, I am I excited about me it. Me too. Thank and you. hoping to hear, you know, of course, more of your poems, um, Wow, I mean, you have Fannie Lou Hamer in here. Uh, you have, you know, Asada Shakur in here. This is like, whoo, this is a history uh, lesson all throughout. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. It was important to put Asada in there. And I, I just want to say before we get off, it's important to talk about Asada Shakur and people like Angela Davis, because if they did not have a belief in democracy, that was akin or something like a faith you have in religion, 
they would not be holding the United States accountable for what they said they're going to do. Hmm. Well, they wouldn't. And they are legendary women indeed. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, Damaris, just for the sake of our podcast listeners here, please tell me where uh, we can contact you and how we can uh, purchase your book and follow you. Okay, the easiest way to centralize that information is at DamarisHill.com. And so you can see A Bound Woman is a Dangerous Thing and in other books that I've authored or been a part of, you can click and purchase them there. Um, Hopefully A Bound Woman is a Dangerous Thing is at your local bookstore. Um, I like to support local bookstores when possible. Um, if not, it, it might be available um, online at, on Amazon or, or other um, venues. Um, and yeah, my social media, uh, Instagram, Damaris Hill underscore about woman, Tumblr, uh, Damaris Hill, Twitter at Damaris Hill, um, Facebook, probably Damaris B Hill. Um, let's see. Snapchat <laughs> might be Damaris Hill. I don't really use Snapchat that much. And I think uh, I try to use Pinterest. Oh, okay. Pinterest is interesting to me. Oh, yeah. I love Pinterest. Uh, mm-hmm. Pinterest is interesting, right? Um, and I think that's Damaris Hill, a bad woman. Okay. So. And you're on Twitter as well, right? I am on Twitter at Damaris Hill. I am on Twitter. Yes. Well, Damaris, it's certainly been a pleasure uh, speaking with you and, he- and hearing your uh, poetic voice, as well as hearing about your writing life and your wonderful book, A Bound Woman is a Dangerous Thing. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. And of course, I will continue to follow you and support everything that you're doing. Well, thank you so much for having me. And thank you for checking in and the work you're doing. This is great. Oh, thank you. Okay. All right. Ta- And you were just listening to episode 16 of Nerdocity Podcast featuring my guest, author Damaris B. Hill. She is the author of A Bound Woman is a Dangerous Thing. Visit her website for more information on her work at DamarisHill.com. Follow the podcast and tweet me at NerdocityPod1. Also follow the podcast on Instagram at NerdocityPodcast. Join Damaris and I tomorrow for an engaging interview and reading featuring her poetry tomorrow on Instagram at Nerdocity Podcast at 2 p.m. Eastern. I also hope that you'll subscribe to my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash doawaworld. Support this podcast by visiting anchor.fm slash doawafraser slash support. Thanks so much for listening. Take care.